Rings of holy memory, rings of holy memory. This week, earlier in the week, as part of my devotions, I was reading a prayer from this book, Ash and Starlight, that a member of this congregation gave to me. It's by Ariane Braithwaite Lem. Probably haven't said that right at all, but you can correct me later. Um, but this prayer, the title of it was, When I Need Some Holy Memory. And the metaphor for this prayer was a tree, the rings that you see once you cut and slice a tree open. And it caught me short because it tried to describe the way our lives have rhythms and patterns and rings around it, how each year a ring grows within a trunk of who we are by God's grace. It captured my imagination for how we sustain rhythms in life. And so I brought as a visual reminder this tree trunk. It's from um, the Kortenhovens. It's red pine, I'm told. And it's got all those beautiful rings around it. Um, I'm told that rings grow when there's times of growth when the light of the spring begins to emerge, new cells begin to grow. But then as the summer begins to dwindle and moves towards fall, then the growth patterns uh, grow smaller and longer and slower. And that's when the darker rings begin to form until winter happens and that's when everything grows dormant. So there's this year-long cycle. And it reminded me that it's good to pause. It's good to reflect on how we are growing in life, to notice where are the places of abundance? Where are the places of flourishing? Where are the places where we've slowed down and there's barely any growth visible in times of difficulty, the times of drought? And to see those patterns not just from one year to the next, but over a lifetime, and to be able to trace where has God been? Where has God been faithful? The pattern God has given to us to enable us to do that kind of work in our lives is Sabbath. Sabbath is that stop, that interruption to your weekly rhythm, where you stop and you ask, where are you, God? Where can I notice you in my life? And so over the next few weeks, we're going to think about Sabbath. We're going to think about Jubilee. That's the theme that Pastor Andrew and I have set on for the next few weeks. Because it's important to recognize how does God recreate us? How does God reconnect us to the divine? The divine patterns of kingdom living. We're living in an age that's after the pandemic. And as you know, the pandemic disrupted so much. And it also blurred those rhythms, those boundaries between rest and play. All of a sudden, many of you were working at home rather than at work. You were able to work remotely. Our rhythms of worship changed too. Some are still worshiping on Zoom. Uh, some are gathering now on Sunday. Some are catching up midweek uh, on YouTube to what they missed on Sunday. So all these patterns have become more blurred, the boundaries. Some patterns have changed. And I wonder, what has it done to our Sabbath rhythms? Has it weakened it? Has it strengthened it? Uh, and what our leadership team really hopes that through jubilee imagination, all these ties of what's important will be strengthened and rekindled again. Because jubilee is about that jubilant celebration of what God can do for us, what it means to be the covenant community, that reset after 50 years of economic equality, of care for the earth, of freedom for those who have been pressed down in patterns of labor that are inhuman. It's an attempted reset for life as it should be. Jubilee says 
imagine what life can be like. And it creates, if you can imagine this carpet, this carpet, this baseline of saying, how can we collectively hold together so that no one sinks lower, so that everyone is cushioned by this carpet, so that no one feels crushed by a lifestyle that's too difficult uh, to sustain. It's a way of instilling hope that we're holding together on this baseline carpet of hope for the lost land, hope for slaves, hope for this reset and this renewal. And Sabbath helps us get there. Sabbath is this protest against conditions of scarcity, of overwork, of inequality of all kinds. And so the passage we read in Leviticus introduces some of these ideas. Uh, the first seven verses of Leviticus 25 say, every seven years, stop working on the land. Let it rest. Let it reset. Because farmers realized early on in their agrarian culture that the way for land to be truly fertile it needs to have a time when it's totally fallow. There's a direct correlation between growth and fallowness. And so God said to Moses in Leviticus 25, every six years go about your work in the land, but in the seventh year, that's your Sabbath, that's the complete rest. And it wasn't just to give the land rest, but it was to give the people rest too. Don't harvest. If you see crops grow, that's great, and you can pick it, but you're not supposed to go about your harvest production. Now, what's the point being made here? I'm, I'm sure it's not saying to all of us, this is a lifestyle of seven-year rest that's deeply sustainable. Even gardeners will have evidence to say that seven years and even 50 years, it's not enough to make land truly fertile. But what is the deeper point being made here and how do we apply it? I think the clue comes in the later passage in verse 20, where people were maybe hearing this and panicking and thinking, how do we eat for a whole year if we're doing nothing to the land. And God steps in and says this, if you say, what will we eat in the seventh year? If we're not allowed to plant or to harvest or produce, God says, I'll order my blessing for you in the sixth year that will produce yield enough for three years. One year's a long time to rest. And God says, don't worry. I'm going to give you a triple blessing in that sixth year that's going to sustain you through that entire seventh year right in to the eighth year. And I want you to stop and notice it because I want you to see that I have enough for you. I'm the God of abundance. And what God was doing here is a bit like the rings on this tree. He was reminding them of where this kind of abundant blessing showed up in their history, in their story uh, as God's people. It's a reminder of God in creation, that in six days, God was able to create this, this world of teeming life, abundant life, in such a way that the early humans weren't worrying and saying, how do we coax this land to grow and bear fruit? But it was the beauty of a man, a man, managing abundant growth and abundant harvests, this wild superabundance of overflowing life. It's also a reminder of what happened in the wilderness after they were set free from Egypt. You remember the test God gave his people. He promised that on the sixth day, there would be this double portion of blessing so that on the seventh, they didn't have to gather, but they could rest and have Sabbath. And so all of this was a test to see if people could see God 
as an abundant God, not as a God of scarcity. It was a test to see if they could trust in God that God would provide rather than them having to do all the work to hoard and hold on and rely on their own capacity. And you know, sometimes I need to hear that because so often in life I get caught in the cycle of scarcity mindset. Do I have enough energy to do what I need to do? Do I have enough resources? Do you have enough people around me? Do you have enough skills? And it can really give us this myopic vision of life. And so Sabbath is that way of saying, stop and look around you. Notice with gratitude how God has provided in abundance. Have you ever watched a, a young child trying to make something on their own? This idea of what they want to invent or create. Um, our youngest does this all the time. And they have the idea in their head how they should go and they get all their materials out and begin to work at it. But very soon they, they reach a snag point and they just can't get their dream into reality with their little hands and the way they're trying to do it. And very soon they're frustrated and they want to give up and just finish the project all together. And then the parent comes over and helps them do so easily what they've been wrestling to do with in that moment. And you can see the child relaxing and realizing the parent is here and the parent is able to do what's so hard for them to do. That's Sabbath. That's when you notice God as a parent is with you. And you can hand over all those things that are frustrating in you in life, where you can just pause and rest long enough and allow God to breathe fresh energy and fresh life into your frustrations. That's one way of seeing Sabbath. Another way of seeing Sabbath is to recognize that land and people have value even beyond their function. Sabbath is a way of saying, God established land and creation long before human beings entered into the picture. And the land and the people are redeemed and bought and owned by Yahweh, just as people were liberated from the land of Egypt. The land too was liberated from always having to serve human beings. The land becomes free to collaborate in the beauty of all creation intermingled and interdependent rather than being simply this object of commodity. And so Jubilee Sabbath is telling us you have worth and it's a worth that's not derived from the labels that, that culture are going to put on you. You have a, a value that's not derived by how other people see you. You have a value even beyond how a denomination or a church or an institution might define you because it's God who sees your true value and your true worth. Too often Sabbath became tied up with traditions. I know growing up, I carried lots of guilt on what I could and couldn't do on a Sunday. But in reality, the Sabbath was given not to induce guilt, but to, to cultivate that deep trust and connection with God, our maker, the one who knows us, the one who loves us, the one who knows our infinite worth. And that's why in Leviticus 25, it goes on after talking about Sabbath, it goes on to say, here's how you care for those who don't feel valued. Here's how you care for the poor. Here's how you care for the people who've had a really tough life and they've lost absolutely everything and they're in so much debt, they're never going to get out of it. Here's how you care for them. Here's how you care for those who feel trapped by their jobs and are working so hard 
They just don't know freedom. And what's the point of Sabbath and Jubilee? It's that nobody should be left behind. There might be someone in the community who's just had a really unfortunate life, a really unfortunate set of events, and they cannot make ends meet, and they feel they've been left behind, and everyone else has gone ahead, and they're doing really well. Or there might be someone who feels, I'm on the outside now because I just don't fit the box. I don't fit the label, and I feel left behind. Or there might be a family that just feels so broken, and they wonder, how has life just gotten so much of a struggle and gotten so hard? The good news is Jubilee is for you. God wants to restore people, to restore the land, to give it worth, to see it as having value in and of itself. God sees the world as special. It's like that birthday card a parent gets from a child. They haven't spent money on it, but they drew it themselves. They spent their time pouring their imagination into that card that's so beautiful, and it depicts the worth of this loving parent to them. And because of that, this card is way more worthy than a card that's been bought in the store. That's the kind of relationship God wants to cultivate with us. And so he put Sabbath in place. This past week, we watched the movie Respect, and this amazing story of the soul singer Aretha Franklin, who spent most of her childhood in this state in Detroit. Her father was preacher in the biggest church in Detroit, New Bethel Baptist. But it wasn't a stable home for Aretha. You probably know the story. Her parents were separated when she was young. Her father had many parties and got Aretha singing at these parties at a very young age that introduced her to many admirers. So by the time she was 12, she was already pregnant with her first child. And it took years of making music to, to try and disentangle her identity from the strong character of her father, from the words of others in her life. And yet towards the end of her career, she decided, I want to go back to what I know is true. I want to go back and make this gospel album. And she was told by her agent, that's going against the grain. Gospel albums don't sell these days. But she wanted to reconnect with the words that were true. Amazing grace. I sweet the sound that saved me, that saved the wretch like me. And so, despite all that she'd been through, she found herself in, in church with the pianist James Cleveland, who'd known her all her life, in this gospel choir trying to sing Amazing Grace. And she kept breaking down because the words were just too close and too tender. And so she ran to the back uh, of the church and James, the pianist, found her there and says, what's wrong? And, and Aretha just says, I, I just feel I can't do this because when I sing these words, it just opens me up and it's hurtful. And if people see me breaking down like this, then they think I'll be mad and I'm going mad. And James said, but Rita, this church is your safe place. This is where you can bring all of that. This is your safe place. And that's why we worship today. Sabbath is our safe place of saying with God, look at me, look at the mess, look at all I've been through. But I know when I worship you, God, that's not what you see in me because you define my story. You see me of infinite worth. You see me of infinite value. And that's grace. Sabbath is a way of noticing God's abundant love on your life. And the whole point of Sabbath is to know that God is present. God is here. God wants to be close. 
most of Leviticus is, is written in a tent of meeting, in worship terms. But the interesting thing about Jubilee and Sabbath is that it begins on a different spot. It begins at Mount Sinai. It says, God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. Do you remember how God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai? It says God spoke with Moses face to face as a friend. This is the place where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, rules to help God's people live in a way that kept this connection, this relationship with God alive and vital. And that relates to Jubilee because Jubilee started on the first day of atonement, the Sabbath day. And atonement is all about how can we clear away all the dirt in our lives so that we're connected to God again, so that we can encounter the presence, the Shekinah presence of God again. How can we get there? And so the whole point of Sabbath, the whole point of coming to pause and to reset is to encounter God as friend to meet with God face to face. After the jubilee commands in Leviticus 25, God says in Leviticus 26, as a result of jubilee, I'm going to stroll back and forth with you. Don't you love that phrase? I'm going to stroll back and forth with you. God's not in a hurry, but God just simply wants to stroll with you in the same way God met with Adam and Eve in the garden, strolling after a long day. When Moses encountered God in the burning bush, God's presence became so important to Moses that moving forward without God was not an option. When God got angry with the people for creating idols and told them, you go ahead without me, Moses said, no, it's your presence that's the most special thing. Without that presence, we're nothing. Stay with us. And that's the idea of Sabbath, recognizing God is here. God is present. God's interested in you. God wants to have that friendship so that he can stroll into the rest of your life. But how do we do that? Well, the final connection I want to make between Jubilee and Sabbath is hospitality. Taking the time to slow down enough that we eat together. Just before Leviticus 25, God talks about bread in Leviticus 24. He says, when you come to worship, the bread of the presence must be in front of you. The same bread of the presence that David took in Luke 6, that Sabbath day, when it was wrong to touch it. But David knew that bread was life-giving. That bread was healing. That bread was enough. And so in a moment, we'll gather around the table and we'll remember all the ways that God is present, all the ways that God cares for those wandering in the world that are still lost and feeling unsettled and unsure of what tomorrow is going to bring, this bread of presence is the reminder that the great I am is here, that the very character and presence of God is here, and that through that bread, the living bread, through Jesus Christ, we have rest. We see our worth not through what other people say, not through what we achieve, not through what we feel, not through how we might feel inferior or superior to others, but we get our worth through Jesus, the living bread, the one who says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Because the reason we find a place at this table is because Jesus rested. Jesus finished the work 
on the Sabbath day. When he said those words on the cross, it is finished. The work is complete. We can't add anything to it. And so on that Sabbath, Jesus rested in the grave. And we couldn't do a thing about it, but we had to wait and notice how God was going to step in and bring resurrection again. And so we gather around this table, not because we've arrived, not because we know that life is all sorted out. We know there's still so many inequalities in this world. We know our world and our lives are broken. And we know that for some people, they're able to worship comfortably. And for many, church still carries pain and questions about belonging. But we still gather round this table, recognizing God is our host. And we are God's guest. And we keep practicing hospitality. And we do it again and again, like that ring of holy memory until we reach that moment of jubilee when he comes again, when all things are made new. So as we finish, I wonder, what do you need to hold before God today? Here are three thoughts or ideas of where this might connect with you. Maybe you're stuck in rhythms. And the rhythms, good as they are, have taken the place of God's presence. And you're more focused on doing the right things, but you're no longer noticing God's presence. Why don't you bring that to God and say, God, show me your abundance again. For others, maybe you simply need to see your true worth in terms of how God sees you not in terms of how your work sees you or how your family sees you, but how God sees you. And finally, maybe you're like that child I was talking about. You're just wrestling with a project and you just can't get it finished. It's just defeating you. And you need that parent to come in and show you the way of abundance. Come to the table and say, God, here I am. Show me what's next. And so I want to close with that prayer. The prayer that talks about when I need some holy rings of memory. Just sit with this. Bring your thoughts to God. Bring all your wrestlings. And may this prayer recreate and remake you. Let's pray. When I need some holy memory, faithful God, like a tree holding sacred stories within its trunk, I began and now breathe because of dark, damp earth. Gazing back on my life, I'm freshly amazed at how you've worked before. Surprises and fidelity intrinsic to the person I now am. Memories of deliverance ground me once again as the wind around me picks up. So I dig with hopeful courage, intertwining my soul with your anchoring roots, praising you as my protector leaning on your wisdom, soaking in your love, seeking you for daily strength and stability. I need those memories, God, as I weather new storms, major change, struggles, frustrations, and anger, ripping limbs off, leaving me stark and bare. Yet, year's mercies, a ring grows within my trunk, some rings thick from lush seasons, some thin and light from drought. 
but I continue to grow and become. All through your grace, keeping my roots in dark dampness that keeps me alive. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.